Good morning and welcome to Grace Cathedral's celebration of spiritual communion for the fifth Sunday after Epiphany on February 7, 2021. Before we begin, I will share a few announcements. Beginning this Sunday at 11 a.m., we will have the adult forum. I will be leading an interactive discussion on the way of love. We'll continue that for three Sundays. Uh, we'll, that'll be on Zoom, and the link is in your e-chimes, and we'll also provide that online. Hope you can join us. Uh, for Ash Wednesday, which is February 17th, we will be having two services of drive-in parking lot uh, church. We will have one at 12.10 p.m. and the other at 5.30 p.m. We will also be broadcasting on Ash Wednesday a recorded service, which can be located on our Facebook page and our YouTube channel, and that will be available starting at noon on that day. Let us now prepare our hearts and minds for worship. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And blessed be his kingdom, now and forever. Amen. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Glory to God in the highest, and, and peace, peace to his people on earth. Lord God, Heavenly, Heavenly King, Almighty, Almighty God, God and Father, we worship you, we give you thanks, we praise you for your glory. Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father, Lord God, Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world, have mercy on us. You are seated at the right hand of the Father, receive our prayer. For you alone are the Holy One, you alone are the Lord, you alone are the Most High, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in the glory of God the Father. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Set us free, O God, from the bondage of our sins, and give us the liberty of that abundant life which you have made known to us in your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. A reading from the prophet Isaiah. Have you not known? Have you not heard? Has it not been told you from the beginning? Have you not understood from the foundation of the earth? It is he who stirs above the circle of the earth and its inhabitants are like grasshoppers, who stretches out the heavens like a curtain and spreads them like a tent to live in, who brings princes to naught and makes the rulers of the earth as nothing. Scarcely are they planted, scarcely sown, scarcely has their stem taken root in the earth, when he blows upon them and they wither and the tempest carries them off like stubble. To whom will you compare me? Or who is my equal, says the Holy One? Lift up your eyes on high and see. Who created these? Who brings out their host and remembers them, calling them all by name? Because he is great in strength, mighty in power. Not one is missing. Why do you say, O Jacob, and speak, O Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord, and my right is disregarded by my God. Have you not known? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the faint, and strengthens the powerless. Even youths will faint and be weary, and the young will fall exhausted. But those who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. 
They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We will now say together a portion of Psalm 147, verses 1 through 12 and 21c. Hallelujah! How good it is to sing praises to our God. How pleasant it is to honor him with praise. The Lord rebuilds Jerusalem. He gathers the exiles of Israel. He heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. He counts the number of the stars and calls them by all the names. Great is our Lord and mighty in power. There is no limit to his wisdom. The Lord lifts up the lowly, but casts the wicked to the ground. Sing to the Lord with thanksgiving. Make music to our God upon the harp. He covers the heavens with clouds and prepares rain for the earth. He makes grass to grow upon the mountains and green plants to serve mankind. He provides food for flocks and herds and for the young ravens when they cry. He is not impressed by the might of a horse. He has no pleasure in the strength of a man. But the Lord has pleasure in those who fear him, in those who await his gracious favor. Hallelujah. A reading from the first letter of Paul to the Corinthians. If I proclaim the gospel, this gives me no ground for boasting. For an obligation is laid on me, and woe to me if I do not proclaim the gospel. For if I do this of my own will, I have a reward. But if not of my own will, I am entrusted with a commission. What then is my reward? Just this, that in my proclamation I may make the gospel free of charge so as not to make full use of my rights in the gospel. For though I am free with respect to all, I have made myself a slave to all, so that I might win more of them. To the Jews I became a Jew in order to win Jews. To those under the law I became as one under the law, though I myself am not under the law, so that I might win those under the law. To those outside the law, I became as one outside the law. Though I am not free from God's law, but am under Christ's law, so that I might win those outside the law. To the weak I became weak, so that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all people, that I might by all means save some. I do it all for the sake of the gospel, so that I may share in its blessings. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to St. Mark. Glory, Glory to, to you, Lord, Lord Christ. Jesus left the synagogue at Capernaum and entered the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. Now Simon's mother-in-law was in bed with a fever, and they told him about her at once. He came and took her by the hand and lifted her up. Then the fever left her, and she began to serve them. That evening at sundown, they brought to him all who were sick or possessed with demons and the whole city was gathered around the door. And he cured many who were sick with various diseases and cast out many demons. And he would not permit the demons to speak because they knew him. In the morning, while it was still very dark, he got up and went out to a deserted place. And there he prayed. And Simon and his companions hunted for him. When they found him, they said to him, Everyone is searching for you. He answered, Let us go to the neighboring towns, so that I may proclaim the message there also, for that is what I came out to do. And he went throughout Galilee, 
proclaiming the message in their synagogues and casting out demons. The gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, Lord Christ. Blessed be the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Twelve years ago, I made a trip with some fellow pastors to the Holy Land. And one day we went to the northern shore of the Sea of Galilee and the city of Capernaum, where the events that we just heard about were said to have occurred. We came in on an air-conditioned bus moving past rows of olive trees and other agribusiness. We walked through the ancient remains of the city, lime and gravel crunching under our feet. We stopped to read some scripture along the way under the shade of mature ficus trees. All around us were signs of a formerly busy fishing town, almost suspended in time heavily influenced by Roman culture, lifted out of the rubble for our inspection. Moving down a gentle slope, we passed the outlines of first century homes and businesses. It was a short walk to the part of town where Simon and Andrew were said to have once lived. Eventually, we came to the site of a modern, bright church whose underside came to a focused point precisely built over the remains of a group of private homes constructed in the first century, to be exact, one home in particular. The architect of this bright, modern new church had smartly left it so that in the middle of the floor was a wide glass-topped opening and what was left under it was open to inspection. What archeologists and excavators had revealed in the 19th century still sits with me. There were three separate eras compacted into one layer. The first going down was a fifth century church, octagonal in shape, Next below that came a cluster of ancient rooms dating to the first to fourth centuries. And then finally at the bottom, that series of personal residences and homes all built around the time of Christ. Reading this evolution in architecture from the bottom up implied that this used to be a place where a lot of people lived and that something truly significant had happened here, and that the story spread and people began to gather there regularly for a long time, about 300 years. And then on the bottom layer, they'd found some simple domestic vessels, but the more that got built onto over the years, the more researchers had found things like storage jars and lamps. A private room had become devoted to public use. By the end of the first century, there was more or less an all-purpose room here. Walls were finished with plaster, a rarity. And, on pe and people had written upon that plaster, they'd graffitied in various languages words like Jesus, Lord, God, Messiah. They'd written, Christ have mercy, Lord Jesus, help your servant. And there were drawings of a fish, a boat, and a crucifix. These were the scribblings of the Roman era. Christians who had stopped by to worship with fellow believers on their way to this place or that their voices were long extinguished, but their words of worship and prayer were written on the walls. That space had become a domus ecclesia, or a house church, a venerated room. Now, normally a trip to the Holy Land can be a pretty frustrating affair. 
You might go expecting to get some confirmation of your personal faith story. Instead, you hear a tour guide say something like this. Well, this is the spot where it's generally believed there might have been a church commemorating the fact that someone once put a rock here so we wouldn't forget something that happened that possibly has a faint resonance in Scripture. And we can assure you, if it did happen here, this is why the evidence is better for it happening here than it is at the next town over. So thank you for coming, and the gift shop is through those doors. That's the typical experience. But I can assure you, this was another matter. I tell you, it felt electric. I could sense the afternoon breeze coming off the water from the south on that day. I could hear the voices of the ancients gathering to listen to this one who had come into their midst since making that scene at the synagogue earlier. I could see Simon's mother-in-law sick and in bed. I could see a brief conversation taking place between Simon and Jesus. In a moment, it was pregnant with expectation and hope. I could feel Jesus' hand on Simon's mother-in-law's hand. I could feel the fever departing from her, new strength surging through her. The news rippling out in every direction, and only a few hours later, the entire city choking the doorway of the home just below my feet. I could see many afflicted with the diseases and physical ailments of the day, either coming on their own power or being brought to the sight, and the truth contained in those three words by Mark, he cured many. I imagine them calling for lamplight after sunset, passing food around, the noise and the chaos of who was going to be next to receive his blessings, words and looks of gratitude to Jesus, bandages falling away, people getting up on their own power, shouts of gladness, a kind of thrilled exhaustion, and a city at peace with itself. Finally, the stillness of the nighttime setting in, all that healing work done and needful rest. And I could see Simon's mother-in-law standing in the doorway, reclining slightly, momentarily against the frame of the door, remembering well all she had seen and heard from the lifting of her fever to getting back to serving to that last person walking away whole. And I wondered what she must have thought of this Jesus, who she'd probably never heard of until that day. And now their very home had become the focus of the single most important day in the history of the town, I wondered, what was her name? Saint Anonymous, for now. You know how imagination works. That extraordinary afternoon and evening from 2,000 years ago passed by in my mind in only a second or two of real time. It was almost no effort at all, followed by a great and hungry longing to see the same healing done in me. Because you read a story many times, you digest it, you become what it is. You eat the word of God and you take the bread of Jesus' body many, many times and eventually what you are is what you eat. You ingest the story. You become the thing that you aim for. You long to incarnate Christ through imitation. You long for it so much, you might not even realize it's happening. But just because you can't miraculously defy the laws of biology, like Jesus, doesn't mean you can't change the world by loving it. 
The world under the glass, below my feet, streets and holy rooms and the graffiti of pilgrims, that was my world too. I knew that story in my bones. I wondered how many had stood where I was standing and also prayed to be more like Jesus. Martin Luther understood the power of imitating Christ in his work, Freedom of a Christian, he wrote, Although I am an unworthy and condemned man, my God has given me in Christ all the riches of righteousness and salvation without any merit on my part, out of pure, free mercy, so that from now on I need nothing except faith, which believes that this is true. Why should I not, therefore, freely, joyfully, with all my heart and with an eager will, do all things which I know are pleasing and acceptable to such a Father who has overwhelmed me with his inestimable riches. I will therefore give myself as a Christ to my neighbor, just as Christ offered himself to me. I will do nothing in this life except what I see is necessary, profitable, and salutary to my neighbor, since through faith I have an abundance of all good things in Christ. Why shouldn't we give ourselves as a Christ to our neighbor, as Jesus gave himself to Simon's neighbors? Not merely talking of him, not merely imitating him, but actually presenting him. In Mere Christianity, C.S. Lewis puts it plainly. He writes, the church exists for nothing else but to draw men into Christ, to make them little Christs. If they are not doing that, all the cathedrals, clergy, missions, sermons, even the Bible itself are simply a waste of time. God became man for no other purpose. It is even doubtful, you know, whether the whole universe was created for any other purpose. We take the story in, we know it down to the details, then we live it, no longer content that it be long ago and far away. It's more than just imitation or a lifestyle. It's really a kind of bringing forth of Jesus. Yet resist the temptation to make this only a vision of exceptionalism or individualism. Remember that Christians only exist insofar as they exist in relation to Jesus, to one another, and to the world. Our imitation must be gracious, humble, not puffed up. Train with the words of Augustine, who said of Jesus, he is the creator, we are the creatures. He is the craftsman, we are the work made by him, he the molder, we the molded ones. This union does not exist in the vacuum of I-thou. It depends on our interconnection with one another as church serving God in the world. I pray Christ's life be your example and goal in these days. Where circumstances seem impossible, remember that God is in the business of working the impossible. God, make us hungry to present the face of Christ to our hurting world. Amen. Let us affirm our faith using the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. 
We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven by the power of the Holy Spirit. He became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshiped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins, we look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. I ask your prayers for God's people throughout the world, for our presiding Bishop Michael and our own Bishop Kathleen, for this gathering and for all ministers and people, pray for the church. I ask your prayers for peace, for goodwill among nations, and for the well-being of all people. Pray for justice and peace. I ask your prayers for the poor, the sick, and the hungry, the oppressed and those in prison. Pray for those in any need or trouble. I ask your prayers for all who seek God or a deeper knowledge of him. Pray that they may find and be found by him. I ask your prayers for the departed we especially pray this morning for our own parishioner, Father Elborn Mendenhall, and among our mem those we remember with flowers on the altar, please include Lauren Maffitt. Pray for all who have died. I invite you to add any prayers or thanksgivings that you might have, either silently or aloud. Praise God for those in every generation in whom Christ has been honored, especially praying today for the people and clergy of St. Paul's Church in Clay Center, and then the Cathedral Cycle of Prayer for the people and clergy of St. John the Evangelist in Spokane, Washington. Pray that we may have the grace to glorify Christ in our own day, O Lord our God, accept the fervent prayers of your people. In the multitude of your mercies, look with compassion upon us and all who turn to you for help. For you are gracious, O lover of souls, and to you we give glory, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen.
Almighty God, have mercy on you, forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is is right to give him thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. Because in the mystery of the word made flesh, you have caused a new light to shine in our hearts to give the knowledge of your glory in the face of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. We give thanks to you, O God, for the goodness and love which you have made known to us in creation, in the calling of Israel to be your people, in your words spoken through the prophets, 
and above all in the Word made flesh, Jesus, your Son. For in these last days you sent him to be incarnate from the Virgin Mary, to be the Savior and Redeemer of the world. In him you have delivered us from evil and made us worthy to stand before you. In him you have brought us out of error into truth, out of sin into righteousness, out of death into life. On the night before he died for us, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. When he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, according to his command, O Father, we remember his death, we proclaim his resurrection, we await his coming in glory, and we offer our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving to you, O Lord of all, presenting to you from your creation this bread and this wine. We pray you, gracious God, to send your Holy Spirit upon these gifts that they may be the sacrament of the body of Christ and his blood of the new covenant. Unite us to your Son in his sacrifice, that we may be acceptable through him, being sanctified by the Holy Spirit. In the fullness of time, put all things in subjection under your Christ, and bring us to that heavenly country, where with all your saints we may enter the everlasting heritage of your sons and daughters. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, the firstborn of all creation, the head of the church, and the author of our salvation. By him, and with him, and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Alleluia, Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. Therefore, Therefore let, let us keep, keep the feast. Alleluia. Praying together the prayer for spiritual communion. In union, O Lord, with the faithful at every altar of your church, where the Holy Eucharist is now being celebrated, I desire to offer you praise and thanksgiving. I present to you my soul and body with the earnest wish that I may always be united to you. And since I cannot now receive you sacramentally, I beseech you to come spiritually into my heart. I unite myself with you and embrace you with all the love of my soul. Let nothing ever separate me from you. May I live in you, and may you live in me, both in this life and in the life to come. Amen.
Let us pray. Loving God, we give you thanks for restoring us in your image and nourishing us with spiritual food in the sacrament of Christ's body and blood. Now send us forth a people forgiven, healed, renewed, that we may proclaim your love to the world and continue in the risen life of Christ our Savior. Amen. Peace of God, which passes all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you this day and remain with you forever. Amen. Let us go forth into the world rejoicing in the power of the Spirit. Thanks, Thanks be to God.